So, yo, Skynet, please don't kill us. I know. With you know what, like I, I love the idea of this like platform. Like it's like I had it in it the other day, having like being able to bring in someone pretty high quality over something like this, and then multicam mm -hmm. like myself and Lee or whoever's in the the studio at the time is like really useful. But the kind of absolute the absolute kind of start off point of trying to get it working and some of the random stuff that's just unexplained like we've literally in the last 10 minutes sat down spoke we're about to record <laughs> you your audio went i couldn't hear you you could hear me and then we we're like mm. right we'll both leave and we'll come back in and that'll sort it and then there was a fire alarm or a suspected fire <laughs> alarm which turned out not to be a fire alarm um but now we're back and everything's working so may it long may it continue <laughs> Christopher Nolan's next film should just be about living in a, a university accommodation and dealing with the tech issues. And everything. <laughs> Try and make that apart. entertaining. Dude, but seriously, like tech issues has just been like my story since arriving here, dude. University is a bunch of smart people using their intelligence in a really dumb way. So, dude, there's like nothing here that makes sense and is being used. Like, dude, I went to like an... So they sent me a thing to matriculate, right? Right. Like, so I can like um, be seen in the system. They send me a link. The link doesn't want to work. Works for other people, though, for some reason. I go to the help desk. They're like, oh, go to this desk. I go to the desk, and they're like, oh, it's not really our thing, but we'll try it anyways. They give me, like, a code. We do the code. I try to go to the thing. It says you don't have access. I go back to the guy. He gives me the access. I go to it. I shit you not, the exact words the computer told me was, you're not entitled to this system. What? And I was like, okay, <laughs> this is strange. Turns out they were sending me to the wrong places and shit, dude. Like, it, it's so weird. Like, everybody here has had IT problems, and the IT people where they say, oh, go there, they'll help you. None of them know what's really happening. It's 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 a freaking nightmare a little bit, dude. So you've been down there for about a week now? You went last Wednesday? Yeah, I went last Wednesday, spent two days with my cousin. I only moved here on Friday. So it's, it's about a week now since I've right, been okay. the accommodation. Mm -hmm. But it feels weirdly longer, dude. Like the I'm not gonna lie, the student union down here is really good. They've just been hosting events nonstop. There's been like music events. Um, I went on a tour in Edinburgh. What was the other things? Yeah, it was that. It was a bingo night. A lot of party. Like it's weird because the accommodation is a little bit outside the city. It this is gonna sound weird. Inverness campus was a lot closer to the city than what this one is. Like right. The okay, closest yeah. shops like 20 minutes away. It's almost um, it's like more trams no, it's and not... stuff like that. Sorry? It's more like trams and stuff like that from like remembering the kind of city that was a long time ago when I was there. Not living or anything, but just like visiting. Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, the good thing is a train, the train, uh, the railway tracks pass literally just next to the campus. So you can just get a train from there. So, mm -hmm. so thankfully, and then it only takes six minutes to reach the city center. So that's actually pretty good. So I might be bouncing there to, uh, this evening. So that'll be really good. But um, what was I going to say? Yeah, they actually built a club on the campus grounds, like with freaking music, blasting like early 2000s, like rap and R&B <laughs> songs and shit. Like, well, as in like a like nightclub. Like and stuff. Yeah, generally, like right on the <laughs> campus ground, literally right in front of the campus. It's called uh, Maggie's. It's like, a, it's kind of smallish, but it's big enough that you could host like maybe about 100, 200 people or something. Mm -hmm. So... Well, that's no, like, it's not bad. Like it's kind of the legit consum... selling alcohol right in front of the thing. It's like the consumerism Sorry? of um of like university and it like the you always see like stuff like shots one pound for students and stuff like that. It's just basically to come down here for your degree and we'll mess up your entire life through the alcohol. Well, funny thing is, I don't think they're giving us any discounts here. I actually think they're selling to us full price. So maybe if we go in town, we'll get better discounts. I've got to be honest. Because I've been going there and like the drinks are like, in, like three pounds something for just like one bottle of beer. Jeez. So like, I don't know if that's good price or bad. Nah, I mean, that's on average, isn't it? Like well, I, rem I remember something. going down to Edinburgh uh, in a nightclub called the Electric Circus and like a pint of beer was like, this is like 2015. So this is before like inflation kicked in recently. Um, I think yeah. it was about five pounds 70. <laughs> Oh so, shit! No, that's ridiculous. Maybe just, maybe just went into a bit of a higher actual lot establishment without realizing it, but um, uh, yeah. Oh, so. as long as water is free, because eventually there's a point <laughs> where it's just like, just give me water. Yeah. Just give, keep giving me water, and I'm fine. Because I mean, at the end of the day, you just want something to drink, just so you don't get bored. 
just standing there speaking to people like I, I know that sounds weird like you need to be in a really engaging conversation but even when you're in a really engaging conversation it's quite nice to just have something to to play around with which is just water or drinking or something I yeah. that's my logic with it but um have you started uni then have you actually been to a class or anything yet i had my induction two days ago so that was me meeting like my lecturer for the first time mm -hmm. by the way guess how big my course is is it like really small is it like smaller than what you anticipated uh, is it like six people only six people well, i got it by yeah, no way on. <laughs> yeah seriously you gotta bang on dude six people and i've only met four so far so the two other ones didn't pop up yet Jeez. so like it, it was so weird and the thing is the other classes around here are like 50 30 plus upwards so like there's some really big like classes here but like ours is like the smallest i'm wondering if like that's going to be a common thing in learning in general this year because i'm starting college again next friday and oh shit from uh, what are you going to be studying i'm um, continuing with the therapy stuff all oh, right yeah i've heard this man um but from the last i heard and this was only like two weeks ago they were putting it off to get numbers in so and i think the minimum that they would do the course at was 12 they said so i wonder if they've kind of changed direction and decided we're just going to run it with like however many people are there like i don't know six eight because it it almost seems like That's having true. a course just with six people on it if people are moving or or whatever or people are taking time off of work or they're having to pay teachers to like tutor this for nine months or whatever it would almost feel like six is probably not even worth putting it on right like that's what they would usually say oh. but I should be really fucking happy then at least they're actually doing it. Like this is showing you how like niche my course is, dude. Like it, it, it's weird. Like I met so many other film students here though, like who are not doing my course. Like there's so many subcategories of film classes here. Like there's a uh, film and media, film and drama, uh, film and uh, I don't know, something else. Right. Or like even some of the drama courses mixed with film but they're like more like film therapy something like that like in ways of helping people and stuff by the way the therapy courses here are huge like literally yeah. like in my flat alone the three of the students here are doing occupational therapy mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's just like super big but um yeah i've met so many other film students and like i think in the accommodation like it's just two of us who are doing global film industries and i only met the the other person who's the last like at my course so it was just like the entire time I was here socializing people, I was meeting people who filmed this, filmed that, filmed that, but none of them were doing mine. And it's quite interesting. It just shows you like how much film artists don't want to do business. Like they really, <laughs> really don't. Yeah. Well, that's that's the thing. Like, I mean, to be fair, man, I'm just doing it because I'm realizing the gap. So yeah, you're saying? Um, so <laughs> I, want, I wanted to talk to you about, uh, we kind of met up before you left. Um, to film a project herself and i know we kind of talked about what it was about at the time but i wanted to kind of pick your brain on it a little bit when we had this little bit of time to speak so not to be clipped out of context this but i waterboarded you waterboarded you on the last day that you were up here for film <laughs> obviously not for any other reasons me and um me and young scott were dressed up like members of the wagner group um <laughs> uh so you said that it's like a little bit of a small film yeah. project, like a CIA type thing, um, like the whole kind of black site stuff. Obviously, yeah, like, be careful what you say in case we get silenced. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Like I, that is still something I'm working on. Like uh, just because I got here, I just like I've been consumed with like moving in, getting mm -hmm. everything. So it's a little bit on. I'm going to continue it this week. But the pretty much what I'm making is a YouTube video that focuses on the real history behind some of the Call of Duty missions. All right, and I want okay. to go through it in order, and I figured out Black Ops because it's the most, ex honestly, it's probably the best campaign. So, like, it has the most exciting stuff on it. So, pretty much what I'm, the first one I'm doing is Operation 40, looking at the real history of it. Not the Bay of Pigs invasion as a whole, but the actual unit that it's based on, which is called Operation 40. And, yeah, pretty much a lot of the stuff about this unit is kind of conspiracy stuff. Mm. Because they're, like, really secret and... Let's just say the most stuff that's known about them is actually relating to the JFK assassination and the uh, Watergate scandal. Like for some reason, these guys, when they, from this one particular group called Operation 40, a lot of them just end up in all these weird things in America. So that's the reason why we we're doing the whole waterboarding thing. It's like I was revealing secret information in the YouTube video. It's legit just going to be a few seconds. There's like, there's legit going to be a line of me saying, ah, this stuff has all been declassified, so don't worry about it. And there's just legit going to cut to three days later. And then it's just me <laughs> getting like freaking waterboarded. Dude, but, some, of the, um, 
at the same time, I'm going to have the American National Anthem blasting because I want to reuse this one clip. Like if I'm ever doing, let's say, classified information on Russia, then I'm just going to be blasting the Soviet Anthem. <laughs> or if I'm doing Cuba, just Cuban National Anthem. But there's going to be like sound effects and everything. I'm going to, I'm going to edit it to make it look as like grimy as possible to kind of make it look like a one of those spy films. Dude, some of the looks... By the way, the footage looks nice, by the way. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, we... we, we hmm? We sat up for about an hour because we had to wait on um, Parallel Finn and then it's getting down there, didn't we? Um, but uh, yeah, like so, some of the looks that we got down there, man. Dear God. <laughs> some of the locals were like... I love the Whoa. fact that I was the one probably... I like the fact that I was the one probably doing the most embarrassing stuff, but not a single person saw me. They only saw you guys. <laughs> well, because I, I, I was the one that had to watch. Do you know what was the best thing about it? It's like... I was a bit hesitant. I was like, oh, maybe I should just like kind of test this out. And then I was like, when we were filming, I was like, actually, let's just go for this. Like, I, I've got to be authentic here. Um, so I did it. And then it turned out yeah. not to be as bad as you thought it would be. But it turned out that we got informed yeah, later that your, your legs had to be like higher than your head or something for it to actually be the real mm. thing. So technically, we didn't really waterboard you. We just made it look like we did for film. But the best thing about it was, is after I, I'd done that and whatnot, and then we did like a, like a kind of close up of, pouring the water you decided oh youtube might not actually like <laughs> me visually getting waterboarded it was like you've only just realized this now <laughs> like you put me through doing this war crime <laughs> <laughs> to be fair though it was more of just a test of shots like i knew beforehand like i probably would not be able to do it but i was just thinking maybe maybe if we got like a perfect shot of it maybe we could but i'm not actually going to use that shot by the way it, it looks way more brutal than it actually is even though like like dude it, it felt fine like you know when you're doing it like i i'm not joking i got really thirsty i just i actually just wanted to drink water like i was just like oh it was so weirdly refreshing even though it was a bit of a chilly afternoon i was just like ah, oh, all right this, this is kind of cool like all right again. but uh no nah, but um yeah, yeah yeah maybe maybe we should try just for I was gonna say for the shits and gigs, maybe for the shits and gigs. Really yep, let's get let's get that war crime <laughs> torture going just for the shits and gigs. But uh, <laughs> when when you did the final scene, no, but when you did yeah. the final scene with like Innis dancing in the background and that, I was having to hold up the towel because lighting. And um, this is how we block out light in professional film, ladies and gentlemen. But, um, <laughs> uh, as I was kind of as you were finished and I brought the towel down, right, I was on like a bit of a cliff. Um, and I, I looked down and there was like three families on the beach just looking up at me like the fuck's going on up there and I was like it was, I was kind of like Cartman in those like South Park episodes where he gets caught out and he's like hey what's going on it's like nothing going on over here <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that, like I know where you're standing that was like I'm not gonna lie it is dodgy where mm -hmm. you were standing and I, I just like the fact that they're all just staring at you it's not like none of them are not saying like are you okay or like or you don't do it they're just like watching they're just like hmm yeah it's a normal afternoon stroll yeah <laughs> oh man because like we were going to do nah, but, Duffus uh, nah, castle and then we're like there's way too many people here and then obviously the bunker because it's like still summer i guess um you know it was just way yeah. too many people again at least it was more spaced out right no one gotten shot or whatever <laughs> mm. no to be fair the bunker was excellent it's just because we were doing it so quickly we just had to like improvise on the spot but otherwise, at some point, if we ever do get like a good day, we should try the castle. The castle actually had some nice spots there. Like you can trick it to be anything, especially the the dungeon part there. Hundred um, percent. I wanted to give. I actually haven't had the chance to kind of speak to you on this, but I, I wanted to give um, a little bit of chat about what's going on in cinema at the moment. And I know the time has kind of passed because it's been in the kind of mainstream for a few weeks, if not a month now. But what have you made of the whole Barbenheimer? <laughs> rivalry that's been going on the whole kind of culture war injection into uh cinema i mean it's been coming for a while but it feels like this is like the absolute head of it right <laughs> i don't know like it's weird because i still haven't watched either mm -hmm. i can only like talk about what i've spoken with people so it's quite interesting i've actually met some film students here who are who really like barbie like really, really like Barbie, even though like, you know, there's a whole controversy behind it with the, the whole thing there. And then I've met, I've actually met more who like Barbie than Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. Scarily, Elena. Like it, it's really weird, but I've met people who are not film students liking Oppenheimer more than some film students. That's the thing. When you run into film students, you think you'd have like very similar tastes and stuff to yourself. 
But no, it's but, very unique. No, but literally all the time they 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 they, they know like this weirdest. I don't want to say all artsy stuff, but like they just they just watch stuff that you just wouldn't watch most of the time. It's weird because like it's rare that you ever come across another filmmaker who watches exactly what you watch. So I mean I can't judge them too much. I mean it's it's their tastes and stuff and it's their own inspirations and stuff. But I don't know. Like for me, I don't want to watch Oppenheimer because it just doesn't seem like a cinema film. Like I, I like blockbusters, man. I like to go to the cinema and see explosions and you know like yeah, you're, you're I like into that the Michael Bay. <laughs> but people keep telling me like. Yeah, yeah, I am, but don't don't don't, don't turn me just in that category. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, um, what I was gonna say, like, I don't know. With like, I heard Oppenheimer's more of a court thing, so I'm like, I, I wouldn't mind just watching that, like, when it comes out after. Yeah. But people keep saying, no, it's worth it just for the bomb. It's just worth it just for the bomb sequence. I'm like, legit, I'm going in there just for that, like, what, maybe one, two minutes of an explosion. And then the rest of it, I'm just sitting. Listening. Like, don't get me wrong. Some courtroom can, dramas can be pretty good. Like, there's a really good one called Philad- Philadelphia, which yeah, I really, with, uh, really want to rewatch. Yeah, Denzel and Tom Hanks. Awesome. Yeah, I really want to rewatch that because I remember watching bits of it and I was actually hooked. Like, I love the cinematography of it. So don't get me wrong. It's nothing against like courtroom things. It's just I'm I like cinema like blockbuster experiences. I kind of miss that. Like I, weirdly enough, I kind of regret not watching Fast and Furious, the lo- latest one in oh, cinema, because I actually oh think I would have had a fun time. Oh, it's dumb as hell, but I would have a fun time in the cinema. Like it, it just—that's the thing. I want to go get hyped, you know. I don't want to. Do you think that's like a dying kind of trend now, the cinema? Because, I mean, I I do go every so often. Like it has to be something that I really want to see. But I think obviously with the stuff like Netflix and Amazon, all these streaming stuff that are now getting like exclusive rights to films that that is, there's a lot less people going to cinema period and obviously things like the pandemic coming and stuff like that has obviously kind of changed the game in terms of hospitality mm-hmm. and public kind of spaces anyway but like like I, actually funnily enough i got a, an email a couple of weeks back from murray playhouse well it wasn't from murray playhouse it was someone representing them and they were because i've just started up this business with the, the studio and that they were offering for, i think it was for like 15 pound a week you could have your sign up in the cinema for six months which I found it was a pretty cool uh, suggestion, but I was like, I don't know if, if enough people go to the cinema now to justify actually having it up there. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Nah, man, they, they, they got to do it the other way around. They got to do the classic way where they're paying you to have an advertisement on your podcast for the cinema. Yeah, that's yeah, the way yeah. that you do it. <laughs> well, that, that's the thing. Like, nah, I thought... but that's still good though that they're hitting you up. Dude. That's that's, like, that's excellent. And like, if if I thought the because at the moment because I've um, invested a little bit into this, and now that I'm now making money back through doing it now, I'm kind of trying to see like the risk benefit factor of doing things in terms of like for example the website that I showed you the other day. I think that's a massive benefit because it's got the domain name of the entire area Money Podcast Studio, so more people get to see it. It looks great quality and stuff like that. So that's a benefit. Whereas if mm-hmm. people were going to see if the cinema was filled out, you know, not just every week, maybe even every second week or something, then I think it would be worth maybe doing it because it is good exposure. But the last few times I've been to the cinema, like, I think the films that I've went to see, it's been in Cinema 3. I don't know if you've ever been in Cinema 3 in Murray Playhouse, have you? Okay, hold on a second. I'm, I'm trying to remember. Uh... It's very small compared to the actual main two. Okay, so there's the big one downstairs. Yeah, that's Cinema there's 1. Smaller one up. That's Cinema Upstairs, 2. Which is like a little bit random. Yeah. I don't think I've been in Cinema 3. No, no wait, I have. It's that really tiny yep, one, isn't yep, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's pretty much just a projector like in your face. You yeah, well pretty much, like a, pretty like much, yeah. Or pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, I I've been in it. Yeah, I've, I've went in the last couple of films I've seen one. it in there. Yeah, that, that, that kind of ruins it. It's weird. Like, that feels like the type of thing you'd like host to like... Let's say you had friends and you wanted to... Yeah, like a private, yeah, private viewing or something. Mm -hmm. For like a birthday party or something like that. Yeah, Yeah, the the parents wrestling match. Yeah. It's like, it it looks like one of those places that Robert De Niro goes in Taxi Driver to watch questionable movies. (laughs) (laughs) No, but I see what you mean, man. Like, no, the problem with the whole streaming thing is like, because streaming services want to pump out as much movies as possible... It has affected film craft as a whole. Like in the past, like people, good or bad films, they put way more effort. Like, I mean, a lot of effort into trying to do something that was like really 
captivating, you know, not like just being pumped out all the time. And I feel like you have streaming films, but I feel like that process has jumped onto cinema films as well. Mm -hmm. Because like, um, this is why everybody's praising um, Tom Cruise these days, you know, with Top Gun and Mission Impossible, because his are the last films that are really trying to go crazy with like unique things. Like they may not be the greatest films ever, but they're really trying to go in you that old school unique angle. Like they're doing like big set pieces that you know are crazy. I mean, Tom Cruise with his suicidal stunts, which is one. Yeah, he does all of them. It is an appealing aspect. People are going to watch that. Yeah. And then like, um, yeah, just the giant set pieces and stuff. I mean, the truth is if you watch modern cinema movies and you watch like a streaming film, they, they hardly look different. You know what I mean? It's, it's just, and how could I put it? with technology being big now, you can like make so much crazy stuff with graphics. Don't get me wrong. I don't hate graphics. I think there's a way to do it in an exciting way. And then there's the kind of, um, yeah, we just couldn't be bothered to go film in that location. So they CG Paris. Do you get what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Like they, they, they CG locations that don't need to be CG. Like it's, it, it is off-putting. It, it's it, like it lacks taste, you know? It's just like, eh. Did you actually see the top? So I think that's actually a big aspect as to why people know that. Yeah, I did. I did. I didn't see it in cinema, but I saw it. I wish I saw it in cinema. Yeah, same. I it's really actually a really good it. film, man. Yeah. I think but, that's a difficult thing yeah, to master just... as well, isn't it? Like doing a film 20, 30 years after the original. Like usually it's like, let's just leave it alone at this point because a lot of them go south. Like I know the the next one of these is going to be the Gladiator remake, remake which we're kind of waiting with, with a held breath yeah. at how bad that this could end up being. But um, we'll, uh, we'll see how it, it pans out, I suppose. I think it's just the weird thing. It's just because like even in the past, they did try to do sequel bait. It was just a lot harder in the past. So a lot of these old classics did have a follow-up story, which I guess the film industry is still thinking the wrong way they, instead of making the sequel they just end up making a reboot for some reason but um now i was gonna say with top with gladiator it's, it's just it was made as a one-off it was the perfect one-off film like i love that film just as it is like i really enjoy it as it, is. it doesn't deserve a sequel and everybody knows it's just a cash grab at that point it's like it's not you can't bullshit anybody with it the <sighs> films become yeah, franchises cool. right like that's basically what happens and franchises make money i mean well i mean that's why i'm here to learn like you know with the film business and stuff because like it, it's 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 how to make money from one film i want to learn like i want to learn how to like how do you get the most success out of one film because in the end like people are just going to go with what's the best money maker i mean if you want support like franchises are guaranteed if they succeed to be constant revenue you know what i mean like you can make a living from it, stuff like that. I don't blame the logic behind it. It actually makes sense. I mean, if you're making a product, for example, with your studio, man, like you want to constantly have customers coming in, you know, as yeah. like, re and forget my words. Like I, I know what I'm trying to say. It's just really hard to put into words, but like you want constant customers, you know, and it's the guaranteed to come for the certain source. Like you, you offer podcasts and stuff and people to like, you know, in a sense, expose themselves by, doing the podcast learning more information and stuff with the film franchise it's really hard when you have like individual things like to make giant cash out of it definitely not like everybody has a niche audience you know am i making sense or am I yeah no 100 percent. because like you I mean you mentioned it with oppenheimer like that's something that has literally split down 50 50 some people say it's the greatest film they've ever seen some people say oh it's just a bunch of talking right because you mentioned it's like a dialogue film more than action scenes and you yeah. know world war three breaking out and buildings going you know what i mean like all this kind of stuff it is more kind of focused on like intense yeah. slow build to a, a historical event well, right here's the thing. i don't think people are going because it's an oppenheimer movie they're going because it's a christopher Nolan yeah film. Mm -hmm. and christopher Nolan is one of the last people who's giving people cinema experience like i had a very interesting conversation with another with one of the guys on my course and he was telling me the other Okay, I mean, it's debatable with what he said here, but he said a lot of Christopher Nolan films are not rewatchable. Like, they're really good cinema one-off films, but to go back and rewatch them, he says, like, it's not as exciting. I don't completely agree with that. I think there are some Christopher Nolan movies which are rewatchable. Like, Interstellar is rewatchable. Yeah. Dunkirk? Dunkirk is a weird one, because I really enjoyed Dunkirk for the cinema experience. You know what I mean? Like, I, when you watch it that first time, it was so thrilling. I can see myself having an issue rewatching it, weirdly enough. Like, I enjoyed watching it in cinema so much. 
But I mean, like Christopher Nolan's rare though. Like the thing is, like if, even if you look at the way he makes films, like the whole IMAX thing, like his cameras are very much meant for cinema. They're not meant for TV and stuff. If you watch mm-hmm. it on TV, it's not the same experience. You know what I mean? Don't get me wrong. They're not bad films. I I enjoy them, but it's it's a rare thing. Whereas with Barbie, I guess it would. I don't know. Barbie had the best advertisement campaign ever in the sense that I think a lot of people were expecting a fun, happy film that wasn't really... I mean, you could see a little bit in the trailer that there was going to maybe a little bit of a social message, but they, they downplayed it so well. And then when people actually went to go watch it, then it turned out like, yeah, um, it turned into a giant lecture. Some people liked it. Some people hated it. Some people, you know, are in the middle. Well, like, but I think it... It's, from, from what, it's what I've heard about it, it's like meant to be quite... It's meant to be like quite tongue in cheek. Like I don't know. Obviously, I've never not seen the film myself to like make my own kind of judgment on it. I don't know if you've seen um. Oh, what's the guy? He's uh, oh, the guy that speaks really fast in America. You know, the guy that talks like all the politics is like he's like if the Republicans get in, then the Democrat Party will not get. In. You know what I mean? Like that that the small guy. What's his name? Hold on, let me let me look. Okay, him I don't up. know that guy's name. I thought you were talking about the rapper Twister for some reason. Like, <laughs> no, no, no. Hold on, let me let me look him up. Um. American political commentators. Um, uh, oh, there he is. Who? What's his name? What's his name? Was it Shapiro? Ben Shapiro. Oh, Ben Shapiro, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. So I seen something. I was listening to a podcast. They were talking about uh, apparently, and then I actually ended up going to watch his video that they were mentioning and he he had went and seen the film right and obviously like because he's um if there was a message in it he's like the opposite of that message he was like you know criticizing it and blah 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 blah. but he had went to like the length or something of buying barbies and burning them on his show afterwards which is it's just like like (laughs) there's, there's like there's things that annoy me or whatever um but i'm not going to go to that kind of lengths to let it bother my life do you know what i mean (laughs) Yeah. To be fair, though, I mean, isn't he? Doesn't he fall into the whole category of like almost like clickbait, like people yeah, just, pandering and stuff like that to audiences anger. and shit. Yeah, because I mean, you see it all the time now. Like even if you're just scrolling through like YouTube or anything, it's always the most extreme story. Yeah, the stuff that triggers the point you. Where I don't know about other people. Well, you see, the thing is, I think I'm over. I've been triggered out. If that makes sense, like I'm just exhausted of it. Like yeah, you're you numb see to it. Everywhere it. now, you just like. Like I actually want something that's a little bit more nuanced personally these days, and I'm just looking and it's just like, oh, uh, this is the worst possible thing ever. This is the best thing ever. You need to live with this, you know mm-hmm. that kind of stuff. It's just, I, I just feel like I'm like, oh, shut up, bro. Just, just give me something that's chilled. Just be like, hey, maybe this is cool for you, you know. I think I'm I don't know, man. It's just I just feel kind of. Sorry. No, keep going, man. It's just the, the little delay. Oh no, that was the end of me there. I was just saying, like in the end, it's just everything just seems to be weird versions of clickbait these days it's just yeah i sometimes i click on a video that um, doesn't seem like clickbait and those videos end up being more clickbaity themselves like anyways man let's skip that part (laughs) i'm knackered out by the stuff (laughs) i think i mentioned this to you last last time i seen you but i went the best like film experience i've had in the cinema is actually going to see uh 1917 just before the pandemic kick I think it was January 2020 when All they released right. the film. And obviously that was like a unique film because, mm. you know, not many had done this, but it was a shot following the majority of the film. I think there was something, it was like maybe six, seven cuts in the entire film or something ridiculous like that, but they tried to follow it seamlessly throughout. So it was like basically five to six mm. massive scenes, right? Rather than, you know, cut, yeah. transition, all the type of stuff. Um, And that was really good. Like that was... Uh, but even to be fair, to be fair, even then, like when I went to see that, admittedly it was like a bit of an earlier showing, so that might come into a fact with people maybe being at work and whatnot. But like there wasn't that many people there watching that as well, you know. So, um, mm, okay, yeah, with, with that one, it's that was an interesting one because I, I think you're right. I think in the earlier showings there wasn't as many people, but as word got around about it, a lot of people went to see it because. Yeah, actually, that's another interesting aspect about filmmaking, uh, about cinema movies. I don't think a lot of people go to watch the film for itself. Some people just go because it's a hype event, you know, almost like a concert. Like, the more people talk about it, it's more like, you've got to see it, you know what I mean? Yeah, the feed of Actually, I think that's the same thing with uh, Oppenheimer at the moment. 
Like everyone's like, oh, you haven't seen Oppenheimer? Oh, it's amazing. How have you not seen Oppenheimer? You know, that peer pressure does weirdly work in uh, forcing you to go see it. That's another interesting aspect of it, actually. But yeah, with 1917, no, I agree. Like 1917 is a roller coaster. You got to be honest. That's the closest thing you can compare it to. And you, you're not, you, you are there for the ride. I mean, there's so many other World War One movies which go into like could go into the same amount of details. But I think many people were there just for the experience of the the weird POV roller coaster never ending throughout the whole film. It was a good film though. I enjoyed it. It's definitely. I'm trying to think what the best cinema experience I had though. Yeah, but like, what, what's strange like the... as it sounds. Yeah. What would be the no, what film are you glad that you got to see in the cinema the most, and what film from any era, any time, do you wish that you'd been able to go to see in the cinema when it first released? Okay, so the film I'm probably the most proudest of seeing in cinema was probably Lord of the Rings: The Two Towers back in 2000 and, uh, two thousand and two. I think. Two, I think. Yeah, yeah, because I think the first one came out in two thousand. Yeah, because they released one every year, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. Two thousand one, two, three. Yeah. yeah, I saw that in cinema, and I don't know, there's something about back then, in the early 2000s, you know the cinemas that were a little bit crackly? Like, yeah, 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 yeah. Just like there was something about that that just added to the cinema experience, and the, the, you know, the sound being way too loud and not, like, balanced out. No, oh, I'm so happy I saw that in cinema. Uh, what was another one? Besides that, from, let's say, from an age where I can reasonably remember things, I'll say uh, probably Gravity. Watching Gravity in cinema was amazing. My mistake was watching it with Scott and uh, I can't remember who else went along with it because they 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 didn't take it and they were like laughing and giggling the whole way through. But like for me, like I don't know, I was hooked in that film. Darn you, Scott! But uh, <laughs> what film do I wish I could have seen in cinema? Ooh. I'm trying to think. For me, it's Saving Private Ryan. I've seen it in cinema, but not when it came out. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be a good one. Yeah, I think probably probably the same. Actually, seeing Saving Private Ryan in cinema for the very first time. Oh yeah, that would be a, that would be amazing. Ah, oh. because that was like such a revolutionary <laughs> film, like coming out in nineteen ninety eight and going to the cinema and seeing the level mm. of detail and stuff like that. Apparently, like when people seen it the first time, like everyone's jaw was just on the floor at how real. And the movie holds up, right? Like obviously they've you know better resolutions yeah. than that you can watch it on whatever you uh, streaming site it's on these days but i still watch it back i try to watch it like once a year because it's one of my favorite films of all time um mm. and just like now it's like i can't believe this film came out over 25 years ago you know? <laughs> yeah but that's the thing like it's a 90s film as well like in the 90s dude honestly for me the best era in cinema is the 90s yeah 100 percent it, like, how can I put it? It's just there was so much different stuff in the 90s. Like you have like movies that look like the 80s that were made in the 90s. You have movies that look like 2000s. And they were made in the, made in the 90s. Yeah, yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. Well, not just that. Like a lot of like pretty much it pioneered the thing for going forward. But that's just American cinema. And then at the same time you have like big ass blockbuster summer blockbusters. And at the same time you have like indie films like Quentin Tarantino and stuff happening there. So things actually look different. And then on top of that, I don't know if it's because like technology's well, technology was not the same around the world. So you had British films, which were just strange. Like they were either like super cheery in the nineties, or there was some of the most, the only way I can describe it, you're watching that film and you feel like you're being cut. Like that's how thriller-esque attitude wise they were. Like it, it's weird. British nineties films compared to stuff today are so brutal. They, there's just something so grim about some of them or really cheery. It's like either end of the spectrum. Like it, it just had its own vibe. And then if you look at Chinese films, they're like, you see how I am right now? Well, how it's like really white here. Mm -hmm. Like on the, on, like, yeah. Okay. So dial that up to like, maybe like 10. That's what a lot of Hong Kong films were like. The, the, the cinematography, they just had different cameras and the camera would always be moving. Like even more than a Michael Bay movie. Like somebody's just like, I don't know, maybe doing bingo and the camera will be like, <laughs> <laughs> doing crazy shit <laughs> that it actually becomes entertaining and because the cultural values are so little different you just get the weirdest shit like i don't know like not a fan but, of using yeah, honestly, tripods like, and then i've even seen russian <laughs> yeah dude i've even seen like russian movies from the 90s and even that just looks like so different honestly like it's just it's strange man no but that's what i mean the 90s was such an original time for film like you could do almost anything and there would be an audience for it 
it's so weird because the 90s is also a period where the studio systems were kind of failing. Like, I, I forgive me, like, the history is pretty complicated, but it's like, the, I think because people went so crazy, the people went a little too crazy in the 90s in the sense that the studio system really doubled down again, like, while going into the 2000s. Like, honestly, the 2000s was probably a recovery. Like, if we're looking at Hollywood, I think it was more of like a Hollywood trying to find its feet again. Because, mm -hmm. you know, like, you're having all these weird films that came out in the early 2000s, but then you have, like, things like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter really succeeding. I mean, I wouldn't say Star Wars. Star Wars... Okay, Star Wars was making cash in the early 2000s with the, the prequel trilogy, but those films... People forget those films were disasters. Mm -hmm. Like, they were not successful when they came out. Like, I'm not saying, like, financially, but, I mean, critically... People hated those films. They're, they're looked the back third more one. fondly third one now like, than okay. what they were on release, for sure. Oh, yeah, it's definitely the nostalgia. Probably the memes. I'm not going to lie. When you look back and watch the films with the memes, the, the films are much better. Like, you, you, you can't help it. Like, you, get, you can, like, point and voice at it. Do you think, but, like, um, do you think the same will happen think, with, like, episode 7, 8, and 9? Because obviously, like, they've received, like, a lot of heat. But do you think in 20 years' time, people will remember them? I've not actually seen them, but... Ah, uh, mm, no, no, I, I generally don't think that will happen. I generally think we're in a period, I don't know, you know, I could be wrong. Like, I, I've met people who like films who love the complete opposite of mine, but all I can say is if people look fondly back at those films, that means the future is really fucked. <laughs> That's all I'm going to say. Like, it's like those future films are going to be really bad if they're going to look fondly back on them because I do think they deserve the criticism. Like, that's a good question. Like people's tastes change over time, but those films were dumb. <laughs> they were dumb. Um, well, the thing is, like every the thing is, everybody realizes now the films that are coming out now are more cash grabs more than anything. So, like, I don't know. It's really hard to find taste in it. Whereas in the past, where well, I feel like those cash grabs, I think there was generally more of an attempt to a little bit of artistry. I think but, there's, there's yeah, like... man, it's. Either way, I'll be able to give you better answers on this after I do my course, man. Because this is all the shit they're going to teach me. <laughs> but like, <laughs> like, right now, I'm just speaking as just like an amateur at this. Like, I suppose as well, when you bring up stuff like Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, and I, I suppose like the success of the original Star Wars and even, I guess, the prequels eventually in the end, is that these were like okay. massive entities in the end right it wasn't just films they made like video games after it. they made f action figures after it people were going to like stuff like comic-con and and you know people were obsessed with these right they were they were like such cult like they, they were such ingrained in culture in the end you know what i mean like well yeah the thing is like when you look back at those things because they're usually like the openings of like the, the you know the franchise kind of stuff okay so lord of the rings admittedly is a bit of a freak in the film industry. Like in terms like what happened with Lord of the Rings was not normal. Because um, the way it went originally when they were pitching the films, um, Peter Jackson and Philippa Fran and uh, the other writers, they originally approached like Harvey Weinstein and they were busy telling him like he wanted them to only make it into one movie, the whole trilogy in one movie. Because originally they were going around, they were only pitching it as two movies. Because remember, Franchise of Things wasn't that popular back mm -hmm. then. So originally, if Peter Jackson and them originally had their original way, like agreed upon, there would only be two movies covering all three films. So it would be pretty messy. Harvey Weinstein was saying, I will not give you the cash. You can only make one film. They were like, okay, now nah, that's that's cutting it too short. Like Lord of the, all, all three films, t story told in one film. Nah, it wouldn't work. So they went to New Line Cinema. And it was actually the guy at New Line Cinema who was like, "This, you can't do this in two movies. you got to do this in three. He was the one who gave them the idea to do it in three and for them to do it. Like, Lord of the Rings was a gamble, dude. Like, they, they didn't know it was going to work. And the thing is, because it was such a gamble, people don't realize, like, the first Lord of the Rings film actually had a pretty small budget compared to, don't get me wrong, it was still big, but it was a lot smaller than other things were getting at the time. Because... Truth be told, nobody really expected it to succeed. Like, it, it was one of these, like, experimental things where I was like, all right, let, let him go do it. And it was just like, oh, crap. It turns out Peter Jackson was such a good director and everybody else, like, not just Peter Jackson, like, every the stars were aligned. Like, so many people did so many good things on those films that it just, yeah, like, the franchise worked. And the thing is, because they were always intended on making those three films as a gamble, like, everything was pre-planned. Um, pre you still there, man? Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. 
Your camera cut. Oh, uh, it should be. Is it back? Oh. Uh, nope. Well, I've got that other camera on me anyway, so I'm still here. So I can still see you and myself and everything. So That's fair enough. We've only got a couple minutes so left anyway. That people... Thank you. But I think that's the thing people forget about the first three films. Like, they were filmed back to back. They had a plan. Whether the first film succeeded or not, they were going to be doing it all with the same tone and all that. That's the reason why those films were really successful, dude. And to be fair, like, uh, they were still sh probably doing catch-up shoots, like, when the first film came out. That's where they got the extra budget to go back and reshoot some stuff. But, um, yeah, man, like, Lord of the Rings was a freak event. Like, even modern franchise things don't really oh well, i mean they try it's weird they, they they try to emulate what they did with that but they, they they bugger it up but i'll get around to that and i think with harry potter was harry potter is an interesting one because if you think about it i don't know i always remember the first harry potter film kind of being like its own film as strange as it sounds because i mean they just based it on the one book you know yeah 100 percent. like i think as well like especially like lord of the rings and that like the films are like what three three and a half hours so like i don't yeah. know if you can do you think you can still make films of that length especially now we're in an age of where attention spans are so like condensed into like you know TikToks brought the whole kind of 30 seconds and uh, <laughs> that's what well, classes the thing, a view now in social media honest, isn't it if you want me to be completely honest i don't think there's any such thing as a film that's too long it's it's only too long if you're bored if you mm. want to be completely honest it's all an illusion. With filmmaking, it's all an illusion. If you can keep somebody's like brain entertained, like you can keep them going for like five hours. Seriously, like you just it's 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 all like an illusion. Like it's setting up a fake reality. You know, you just got to keep somebody hooked. You need to keep them engaged for that time. It doesn't have to become that. The thing is though, like truth be told, you're only going to get a certain niche audience that you can hook onto. So I think the trick is is like if you're going to do something that's long, you got to know your audience. Mm -hmm. you got to realize that there's a type of audience that's going to stick with it and there's going to be a big audience that's going to reject it. Personally, that's what I think makes good films. Like, if you know your audience, like, you, like for example, if you know your audience and you're not trying to hit the big fish, in a sense. Like, probably A24, they're the best example of, um, of people who I think know their audience. They know their films are not going to make big box office numbers, but they know they can get hardcore audiences because they make these like, you know, really artsy side, like maybe horror kind of things. They know that they have a very niche audience that will constantly come back to watch those type of films. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like they're relying on that constant hardcore audience more than they're relying on a bigger audience. Cause that's the thing with a lot of these big blockbusters and things. They try to get as many people as possible instead of like, um... yeah, I'm not, this is weird. It's going to, I'm going to sound like I'm contradicting myself here. Franchises try to, like the big mainstream films, they try to get as many people as possible. And I think they want to try to keep that many people as possible hooked. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. when, go start, when you start doing events like that, people are going more for the events than the actual franchise. So they're not actually there as much for the franchise as they're much there for the event. Like, for example, um, no, 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 never mind. This is a bad example. I'll, I'll just keep going. But then again, you'll get something like, uh, you know, Red Dwarf. Yeah, the TV show back from the 90s and that, like Craig Charles and everything. Yeah, yeah. There's a reason it's still going. There's a reason it's still going. It's because it's not because it's big and mainstream. Like, it's been overshadowed for a long time it's now. because it's it has, like, like a core it on fan games. base. It's, like, it's got a very hardcore fan base that keeps it going. And it keeps it profitable. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So, like, um, in the end, like, I think... If, like, okay, so ideally, the way I see it, let's say I was in charge of a studio and we're doing like films. I ideally would want to like do films aimed at specific audiences to keep them hooked because I personally think that's a better long term strategy for making cash than trying trying to go for big gambles all the time. Now, here's the thing: you can't really predict what will be successful in big gambles because a lot of filmmaking is a gamble. You, you're throwing it out there to see if people like it, and I mean, people go crazy. They try to improve the chances by going crazy with like uh, advertisements all that kind of stuff. But in the end, it's still pretty much up to the stars. So like me, I'd rather like pick a, a niche audience that's very hardcore about something, do it to the best way to respect them as possible and keep them there. And if that happens, and if you do it well, I think that will echo. You see what I mean? Like people will hear about it. They'll be like, oh, this is really good. Go check it out. Weirdly enough, that kind of has the same effect as um, everybody going to see a blockbuster. But it's just like, how can I put it? Probably an excellent example is Game of Thrones. I think when Game of Thrones first came out, it was pretty niche. 
Do you think? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, definitely. Because like that, I I watched that first season. I remember like trying, and I was actually having a hard time. But it was like if I remember, I don't think people. I think people went crazy over the season one's ending, which attracted more people. But then the madness of the following seasons really hooked people in. They're like, oh, you gotta check it out. They did it so well. Do you see what I mean? Like they kept. Yeah, yeah. They kept like the cliffhangers and engagement going and stuff like that. Yeah, that people who are never gonna watch it originally just came by to watch it. You know, it's like word of mouth. Like if you do something really excellently, word of mouth ends up keeping it a good long-term thing the only problem is like it's how to mix business practices with that it's it's really hard like yeah it's definitely a uh and a kind of trying to think of studios that from the 80s that are still around like i'm trying to think of film studios from the 80s that are still around there's very very few yeah i mean the only one that i know that's guaranteed to still be around is like disney channel disney uh yeah just disney. that's just like that's a massive they're, entity and they're not just like films anymore are they? they're doing like tv series and they've got oh, their own streaming site and the the exactly, theme parks like and all that kind of stuff like uh hold on metro golden mayor i think they're uh yeah metro golden mayor has been around for a long time i don't know too much about them so i can't speak about them but they're the ones who did like the original james wait hold on a second metro golden mayor because i know they do the james bond films Oh, that's an American company? I always thought it was British, weirdly enough. Holy crap. All right. So probably one of the most successful like studios you could ever check out is Metro Golden Mare. So, uh, okay. I'm pretty sure they do more than just movies. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, you have to nowadays, don't you? Before. Like, I would imagine you just can't survive well, without kind of branching like, off. You no, know, that's the thing. Like, films is actually like a bad area too. <laughs> to guarantee profits from if you actually look at the history of filmmaking like it's just oh you're back yeah the camera's working again. <laughs> all right no but um yeah man it's, it's just the reality of it it's just like filmmaking is actually a very hard thing to make a profit from so like this is why it truly is the artist domain yeah, like, yeah. i think if people are going to make movies they need to be aware that it's not always going to be the most profitable thing yeah for sure which is quite hard because making movies is fun and you need to make profit in order to continue to make you yeah, know, it's a weird just to um, even make the thing. film itself you need like the funding and stuff like that you know what i mean regardless of trying to make money on top of it you know to survive in general uh, obviously like the higher echelon it's not as big of a deal because you're getting paid that much well, money this is that... the thing, though. but then again sometimes films get too big of a budget like i this is gonna sound weird as much as a big budget seems like it'll be a good thing for a film i sometimes think a giant budget is actually a bad thing for a film like it money's temptation dude like mm. you put that amount of money given to people people are going to find as much ways to pocket it as possible like i already have enough stories from some of my lecturers about like how um how can i put it one of my lecturers told me a story about like how he uh, was doing an advertisement for like a company in the emirates like a and a, a flying a flying company not i don't think it was emirates, uh, fly the, emirates airline, the airline but, you know one of those yeah, I don't think it was them exactly, but he said there was a it was an airline out there that he was hired to do with partners to do uh, an advertisement for, and they end up getting a ridiculously big budget. And he was like, when he spoke to his partners afterwards, he was like, "Dude, this is more, way more than we actually need." And they were like, "No, no, 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 no. This is exactly what we need. This is what, exactly what we need. We we, we need it for resources and stuff." Dude, half of that cash went up their noses. Mm. Like it was just for drugs. Yeah. Like people. <laughs> When they get that amount of uh, cash that is more than necessary for the actual project, yeah, they, it's going to disappear, man. Like, it's quite a, like you can find hundreds of stories of greed within the film industry. And I suppose as well, like when money comes into film, there's also like influence that can be bought with stuff like that. Like, not to go too deep on it, but like we've obviously had, for example, like the Disney stuff and that. Like, it's massively backed by like China, right? And anything that's kind of their government doesn't go along with usually gets cut like the most famous one being when do you remember like john cena was in uh one of these films that they had invested money in and he had said something like taiwan was like a an independent nation or something and they got they made him like apologize in mandarin do you remember that like that's nuts do you know what i mean so i think that was uh i think that was fast and furious actually it was yeah. one of the fast and furious films where he was advertising they were just like yeah but then again i seen like a joe... oh man yeah, yeah the whole political i seen like a joe rogan episode yeah of where they were reacting like a chinese film and like uh they were saying how 
uh, creepy and scary it was that the like this Chinese made film had like the Chinese military fighting Navy SEALs. But I'm like, that's a bit kind of like hypocritical though, because how many like forms of media do we have fighting them or the <laughs> Russians or something? You know what I mean? Like so. Ah, right, true. Like um. Oh, sorry, man. I'm just I'm just noticing the time here. Are you yeah, good but we can wrap up, man. We can wrap up. So um, it's been good speaking to you again, man. It's been good seeing you. Um, going forward, because yeah, me, no you and, me, you and Scott and Finn are thinking about maybe doing something once a month, like a Media Minds thing where we talk about cinema and TV and uh, video games, all these types of forms of media and stuff like that. This would be a really good kind of avenue to do that because we could have you up the top on the laptop so you could see all of us at the table and I'll just have two different cameras on um, me, Scott, and, and Finn. So that would we'll be... We need to find a way of... Uh... We need to find a way of categorizing it though, because like as you find out with me, like once I start going down the rabbit hole, yeah, yeah, yeah. I end up going like yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. I end up going over here, and I haven't like I haven't rounded off what I said because even I'm even listening to myself as I speak. I'm just like, am I making sense? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like what? Like I end up confusing myself, and now I'm realizing, oh shit, I might be contradicting myself here. So it, it is an interesting mind. Uh, uh, was a thinking experiment, but I do like it. It does make me wary of what I'm I, I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. But I think that's the beauty of podcasts though, right? Like going off on tangents and going down different avenues kind of makes it less, you know, news readery. You know what I mean? Like, um, so uh, oh, yeah, b enough. before we go, uh, do you want to tell anyone that might be listening where they can find any of the films that you've made previously or ones you'll be putting up going forward where you can find your Afro Scott page and stuff like that? I know you've got a YouTube channel and you're on social media as well. All right, just type, um, if you go on YouTube, just type down, hold on, let me double check so I make sure. I believe it is Afro Scott right Productions, right. but you can fact check me on that. Yeah, hold on a second, I got my YouTube up here, Afro Scott. Yeah, if they just type down Afro Scott, hold on, let me just type down Productions just to see if that does a better search, because YouTube is pretty eh these days. Yeah, just type down Afro Scott as one word and productions afterwards, and then you'll come across my YouTube channel. Like, it's more just a showreel of my work and what I do, but I do upload my what I consider to be my professional stuff I made mm. up there. We've got the documentary yeah, that we made together on there as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. We've got Nick Sacrifice, Nick. Kyle the Can, uh, Damned, which obviously won a few film <laughs> awards as well. So, congratulations on the success of that, yeah. obviously. Um, and Cheers, man. we'll speak again soon, whether it be Hopefully. through this format or in person. Um, just uh, just before we go as well, um, when I end the recording, if you just stay for a second, because we're both at ninety nine percent, so it literally should just take a minute to finish off uploading uh, your file. But um, yeah. this has been a good little kind of. I'll leave it for like five minutes. Okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, uh, so yeah, this has been episode ninety six of just like testing Riverside FM out because there was a bit of an echo in the last episode we did. So thank you very much for coming on and having a little chat about film, me waterboarding you for a film, and uh, everything in between. <laughs> Not for this man. Always a pleasure, bro. Yeah, I'll catch you. likewise, man.